Winter arrived early in 1956 in the Berkshire Hills of western Massachusetts. A cold front had come down from Canada and by Thanksgiving we were skating on our pond. A week later, a nor'easter had dumped over a foot of snow on my hometown. In the weeks before Christmas vacation, the skiing hill behind my house became the universe for me and all of my second grade friends. During that previous summer, my father had cleared that hill so we could use it for sledding and skiing. And each day as I sat in the classroom, my attention span diminished as the dial of the clock approached 2.35. When the closing bell finally rang, my friends and I would scramble from the classroom and run as fast as our legs would carry us to get on that hill. One day, after another big snowstorm, we took some rides on our flying saucer sleds. After a few rides, the snow became so fast that I shot out of the track and I slammed into one of the tree stumps that was left from the summer clearing. The pain I felt was unbearable. I watched helplessly as my left leg continued to move violently in uncontrollable spasms. My friends ran through the deep snow to get help. Without understanding the severities of my injury, my father threw me over his shoulders, carried me off the hill, placed me in the back of our station wagon, and drove me down to the hospital. An x-rays revealed that the impact had shattered my femur in two places. And back then it was considered too risky to operate on a young child to install a plate, so the doctor's only option was to immobilize my leg in traction, which would confine me to a hospital bed for over 12 weeks. And one early afternoon, I was taken away from the fun of being a child. I was taken away from my friends. I was taken away from being able to play in the outdoors. And it was now Christmas time in New England with over two feet of snow on the ground. By January, I began to understand the concept of agony when I look out of my hospital window to see all of my friends across the road skiing every afternoon on our town's rope tow. January went by slowly and painfully and the snowstorms became more frequent. Being confined to a hospital bed, I suffered from severe bed sores and the simple acts of having my sheets changed and being assisted to go to the bathroom in a bedpan became humiliating and degrading. The hospital was stuffy, the air was stale and it always smelled like rubbing alcohol and nurses drinking coffee. I was just a young kid in the second grade and I was deprived of my friends. I was deprived of the joy of physical activity and I was being cheated out of a New England winter. In early February, a television serviceman came to install an antenna on the hospital's roof and the cable needed to be routed through my window. The nurses propped me up in my bed and they wrapped me in some thick blankets. And when the window was opened, a wall of frigid air came rushing in and it formed a white vapor cloud that rolled over my bed and onto the floor. The impact of that frigid air hitting my nostrils and filling my lungs was the most exhilarating and purifying experience I'd ever known. I lunged for the window and I begged the nurses to keep it open, but they physically overpowered me and they restrained me back in my bed. They told me that the window would have to be closed so that I wouldn't catch cold. What do they mean by cold? I was a little second grade New England kid who always loved everything about winter and no one had ever told me that cold was a bad thing. To me, cold was when you and your best friends whitewashed each other at recess. To me, cold was when you shared stories with your grandfather while snowshoeing deep in the Berkshire Hills. And to me, cold was always a time for celebration and joy. When the nurses closed that window, they began to close my spirit, but then my spirit began to open that window. The day that window closed would forever influence my love and appreciation for cold weather in the outdoors. Through that winter, and in that moment, I developed an acute awareness for the beautiful world of winter that was on the other side of that window. When that window closed, I suddenly realized that my childhood and innocence were being stolen from me, and I wasn't about to let it go. The spiritual uplift that came from that sudden blast of cold air made me vow to the Almighty that if I ever got out of that hospital and if my leg ever healed, I'd live in the outdoors for the rest of my life and I'd never come in. 
In late March, I finally left the hospital in a wheelchair. By then, winter was gone and the snow had melted. During the following summer, my, my leg healed completely and for the rest of my childhood, I lived on my hometown rope toe every day after school from early December until March. Whenever it snowed, my dad would cancel his appointments, load the old station wagon with our skis, pull me out of school, and we'd head for Vermont. And each evening, my face would fall into my dinner plate from exhaustion. And every winter day was, and it still remains, the best day of my life. While I was cheated out of the winter of 1956-57, the experience enhanced my love for the outdoors and my capacity to embrace the cold weather with a passion that has not waned over the last six decades. The smell of cold air and the onset of another coming winter excite me now as much as they did when I was in that hospital bed 56 years ago. Those who have ever complained about snow and cold weather were never cheated out of a winter the way I was. And as for that vow that I made with the Almighty, well, he certainly kept up his end of the bargain. He gave me back my leg and he let me leave the hospital, but most importantly, he let me continue to be that same little second grade kid who on each winter day still hears the bell ring at 235.